This is Power Trip, the story of energy. I'm Michael Weber, and I study energy and water. In the modern world, energy is all around us. It liberates us from the burdens of just trying to stay alive. There are all these things that energy gives us that's really incredible. It's embedded in the products we use. It is what enables the things we like. Lights, computers, moving cars. So energy gives us the products and services, the capabilities, the freedoms we really like. That's the modern world. It's very easy in our modern day view to think that energy, the way we have it today, is the way energy always has been and always will be. But in fact, the story of energy is a story of change. Energy has changed over time. We've changed the types of energy we've used, the types of fuels. We've had transitions from primitive fuels like wood, cow dung, peat, grass, straw, things like that, that we would burn for heat and comfort and cooking. And that has advanced to other modern forms of energy like electricity that we use in the home today for computers or our lighting and air conditioning. In the Middle Ages, we had water wheels and windmills that would take the natural forces of nature and turn it into mechanical power. We had an era where wood was dominant. We had an era where coal was dominant. We're in an era now where oil is dominant. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what's next? Who stood amongst the target charts, the escape kits, and the stale coffee, and said a prayer for the Enola Gay and civilization? Unlike most new forms of energy, nuclear energy was revealed to the world with a bang. The first nuclear bomb that was used in wartime was used in Japan on Hiroshima as a way to bring about the end of World War II in Japan. The bomb run lasted four minutes. The bomb went away at 9.15. The ability to create and deliver a nuclear weapon to end World War II depended on two other forms of energy. It depended on electricity from hydroelectric dams, and it depended on petroleum to power the planes that dropped the bomb. So I often think of the end of World War II as a combination of plutonium, petroleum, and water. These are the three ingredients that all came together. Back in 1951, this reactor was also the scene of a significant piece of history. The first demonstration of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes for electrical power happened in 1951. And that was a small demonstration plant. That was the time we realized we can use the heat, we can harness the heat of nuclear reactions, of splitting the atom to make electricity. And that led to a whole new wave of deployment of nuclear power. From the 30s to the 60s, the United States was going through rural electrification, the desire to electrify rural areas as a way to lift people out of poverty and to have people improve the quality of their life and have economic development. Electricity had already arrived in cities, but it had not quite made it to the rural areas. So there was about a 30-year build-out of the power sector in the United States from the 30s and 60s. We needed power plants. Hydro had been built in the 30s, but we started to build other types of power plants, coal and oil and gas, that kind of thing. Then we demonstrated nuclear power. All of a sudden we had another option for generating electricity that could work at large scale. So after some experimental designs in the 50s, it started to get built for real in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So we had a 30-year build-out of nuclear power. Part of that was the Atoms for Peace program that was really accelerated with Eisenhower, creating government agencies and funding. I need hardly point out to this assembly, however, that this subject is global, not a merely national in character. But part of it was also just the demand for electricity. The Navy liked nuclear for different reasons. You can get a lot of power out of a device that's very compact. And instead of dragging large fuel tanks of diesel around to move your ships or submarines around the world, you could have a small amount of fuel give you a lot of energy. And this is particularly useful for an aircraft carrier, which is very large. By not having large diesel tanks, you had more room for people or planes or other equipment. For submarines, by having nuclear, it meant you could stay below water for longer. They're using the nuclear to make electricity, and the electricity drives electric motors to propel the submarine, but also to serve all the other loads on the submarine, the lighting, the cooking, the air conditioning, that kind of thing. So nuclear was really transformational for the Navy because it let them stay below water longer or to travel longer distances before they needed to refuel. Until 1950, the United States could supply the energy needed. But in less than 25 years, we found ourselves in trouble. 
crude oil production dropped. In the 70s, the United States was dealing with the oil security crises and building more power plants that used domestic forms of energy rather than imported oil became important. So we built a lot of natural gas power plants, a lot of coal plants, and also nuclear power plants. In a country like France, which also suffered the downside effects of the oil supply cutoffs in the 1970s, they also had to build a power fleet that relied on domestic fuels. But France doesn't have a lot of natural gas, and it doesn't have a lot of coal, so they built nukes. Today, in the United States, we get about 20% of our electricity from nuclear energy, and in France, it's about 75% from nuclear energy. Nuclear energy had an incredible ability to generate a lot of electricity using a small amount of fuel. It's really incredible technology and it's remarkable science. But it's also kind of scary, and scary for a few different reasons. One is, is because it can be used for a weapon, as the world found out in 1945. So it's scary from a weapons and death and destruction perspective. It's also scary because of risks to public health and public safety if you have a meltdown or an uncontrolled chain reaction at a power plant. And this was on people's minds because of the near accident at Three Mile Island in 1979. At Three Mile Island, we had a near miss where the power plant there, Three Mile Island, which is the name of a power generating station in Pennsylvania, almost had a meltdown. And the safety systems almost failed. And it was close and no one died, but it introduced to a lot of people's conscience the reality of risks of nuclear power. But a government official said that a breakdown in an atomic power plant in Pennsylvania today is probably the worst nuclear reactor accident to date. Seven years later, in 1986, Chernobyl happened. And people did die from that. And that did release large amounts of radiation that affected agriculture in neighboring countries and still affects the area in Chernobyl where the power plant went out of control. The Soviets may have been fairly quick to acknowledge the accident because evidence in the form of mild nuclear radiation had already reached beyond the Soviet borders to Scandinavia. It's also scary to people because of the long-term effects of the radioactive waste, which must be managed because the waste itself can also be dangerous. So you have these weapons concerns, these environmental concerns from the waste, as well as the public safety and health concerns of meltdowns or accidents at nuclear facilities. Movies shape and reflect our opinions on energy. And this is especially true with nuclear, where movies and Hollywood have two opinions of nuclear simultaneously. One is nuclear is dangerous and puts society at risk. This is portrayed in movies like China Syndrome. The other identity is that nuclear gives us the ability to travel in time and be a superhero, like in Back to the Future or Iron Man. Unfortunately, no, it requires something with a little more kick. Plutonium. Uh, plutonium, wait a minute. Are you are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? And so nuclear is the end of the world or gives us superhero powers, which is really incredible. Whenever you see nuclear portrayed in the movies, it's almost always portrayed with a blue glow, a blue ring in some cases. And this is called shrink off radiation. It's the view you get of light when it's moving through a different medium and the speed of light in water is different than the speed of light in a vacuum or in the atmosphere. And because of the speed of the radiation in the water, it has this blue glow. So when the movies are showing a blue glow for nuclear, it's based in scientific fact. Nuclear energy has trade-offs just like every other technology and every other form of energy. There are some things that are really impressive about nuclear. One is that you can get so much energy from so little mass. That means less mining and less disturbance of the land in power plants that generate a lot of megawatts of power and electrical capacity in a small footprint. The other benefit of nuclear that's really prominent is it doesn't have a smokestack. It doesn't generate fumes that we pump into the atmosphere. It doesn't have the pollutants that cause acid rain. It doesn't have the pollutants that will get into our lungs and give us asthma. And it does not generate greenhouse gases while it's generating electricity. If you look at a nuclear power plant, you'll often see these large plumes of what looks like smoke. That's actually just water vapor. That's the cooling that's used to keep the nuclear reactions under control.
The year is 1951. These barrels of radioactive waste are being dumped into the Atlantic Ocean, 120 miles from the coast of New York City. There are three main downsides for nuclear. One is the waste which you capture is quite nasty. It's very hot, it's very radioactive, it has a half-life of 100,000 years or something like that. So that means you have to build long-term storage or management capabilities for the waste to protect ecosystems and human health. A second risk or downside in nuclear is that you have to worry about public safety. You have to worry about avoiding meltdowns or uncontrolled nuclear reactions that could release radiation into neighboring systems or airships that would put people or agriculture or systems at risk. A third downside for nuclear is the risk of weapons proliferation. We know nuclear energy is compatible with weapons because that's how we introduce it to the world. We have to worry about tracking the materials and the experts so that they don't turn the nuclear materials into weapons. And that has happened before, where we worry about nuclear experts in Pakistan building weapons for North Korea and this kind of thing. So we have to manage those risks. There are also other concerns about the cost of building nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plants tend to be pretty cheap to operate, but pretty expensive to build. There are two great risks for humanity. One is nuclear holocaust, and the other is global climate change. And nuclear can be a cause of one and a solution for the other. When we think about nuclear, we have to remember it's one of the options available to us for a low carbon future. But it won't be an option unless we solve its problems. It's time for us to think about nuclear.